Hi everybody, this is the Cricket Badger podcast. Each badger marks the track with its own scent. His black legs are short but very powerful for digging. The name badger probably comes from the French word bêche, meaning digger. And hello, very warm welcome to another edition of the Cricket Badger podcast. And it's been a weird old day today. Um, somebody said to me this morning, um, you must be really pleased um, that uh, the ICEC has come out and issued um, the content of the report that it did do, the recommendations and to take it so seriously, such a comprehensive um, review of English cricket. And I must admit, when I first heard, um, which was yesterday, first heard what was in the um, ICEC report, there was a kind of brief moment of thinking, yes, at least they've taken it seriously. But then sat back and thought, it's taken three years of utter, utter, utter crap to get this far. Um, and also, um, if you're celebrating and you're punching the air because you're pleased that cricket's finally taken and the issues of racism, sexism and elitism seriously, um, you're almost punching the air over the... Uh, um, misery of all of the people that were affected um, and all of the people that have spoken to the ICEC. Um, 87% of Pakistani and Bangladeshi people have experienced racism within the game of cricket. It's just absolutely obscene. Um, anyway, I am joined by uh, Dr. Thomas Fletcher. Um, welcome back, Tom. It's very good to see you again. You were a guest on the podcast some time ago now, I think just shortly after Azim's DMS, DCMS appearance um i as i say i found today very mixed emotions it should not have taken cricket this long to actually finally admit that it's got an issue no um thank you for having me uh by the way again um no i agree um and i think the sad thing is it, it there's nothing in there really i think apart from the figures that you just quoted the kind the, the actual you know the mm. numerical data there's nothing that's really surprising right. is there in here and, that, and I think that's the, one of the things that will stand out. It's not surprising, and yet we've waited and waited and waited to find out what it was going to say. It's like you probably could have said what it was going to say, you know, two years ago, and it's, yeah. it's just taken the report to well, kind of confirm it. I know there's a degree um, in cricket. I mean, I saw Ben Stokes' press conference, and bless him, he kind of read it off a piece of paper, yeah. obviously wanting to get certain points across, but didn't want to get them across wrongly, so read them off a piece of paper. Um, which I don't think looked great, but I can understand why he did that. Um, but we've seen today, obviously, the ECB have taken the first recommendation of the report and come out and publicly apologise to anybody ever affected by any of the issues contained therein. But then I watched today as the um, counties, quite nicely orchestrated, really, came out and said, we welcome this report. Um, there is no place for any isms, basically, in, within cricket or sport. And you're thinking, well, if... If I'm not surprised by this, and I kind of could have written this three years ago, and if you're not surprised by this, and you could have probably written this longer ago than that, um, why are the counties, A, surprised, and B, if they are surprised, they shouldn't be, because they're not doing their job properly if they're not monitoring this, and why are they not doing more about it? Yeah, all very robotic, isn't it? And 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 there's various equalities organisations as well who are kind of tweeting, this is our response to, this is our response to, and you think, it's, you know... You, you know, you've all got a voice on it. You've all got a vested interest in it. I think from the county's point of view, and I say that with, with I suppose, with some level of experience having, you know, done some work with the counties last year around EDI and, and inclusivity and whatnot within the venues, is that they're just crying out for help. Yeah. So the whole kind of, you know, we welcome it. And this, because they want some recommendations, they, they want someone. And that's not, I am not at all um, kind of poking fun at the counties or, you know, treating them as a straw target in any way i think that's what they need they yeah. needed or need or needed someone or something to come along and say right this is the evidence this is what we've got 
and this is what you can do about it because most counties are not geared up to act you know not meaningfully anyway they can kind of pay lip service to it and kind of make various commitments but they genuinely they're not edi professionals they don't you know they don't necessarily know how to do that and that's that's fair dues did, did you read the the term entrenched and the uh, report basically said that racism is entrenched um basically within the game um, as institutional, basically, just another word for institutional. Um, and often, I mean, entrenched is quite a good way of putting it, uh, I think, because often it's hidden, isn't it, from people working in organisations, people that are affected by it, can't quite work out why this is unfair or what's going on. But it's, yeah, the systems have been set up years and years ago, um, probably for a non-multicultural England, as it was would have been when cricket yeah. first started. Uh, and therefore... Cricket hasn't moved with the times, has it? And that, that's where this entrenched comes from. It doesn't mean that people are walking around with crosses burning in the um, car park. It, it just means that the game has not moved with the the New England. Yeah, and and I suspect, <clears throat> don't get me wrong, the vast majority of people who work in cricket or play cricket, or whatever, they're, they're not racist. They're not homophobic. They're not misogynists, you know, not in their daily lives. But what they do is, A, they kind of go with the flow at the time. So they normalize it, they don't challenge it. And B, they enter a system which, as you say, is just that that is just how it's done. And no one really questions why is it done that way and how might we do it better? How is it failing some communities over others? And ultimately it's just, well, that's the way it's always been and it's worked, or it's worked to a certain extent without thinking about the wider mm-hmm. context of who is it working for and similarly, who is it not working for? I um, should have said when we we started this you've done a lot of work in this area for people that don't know um dr thomas fletcher um author of the fletcher report you've done a lot of you're academic basically aren't you you've done a lot of um, (laughs) chatting to people you've done a lot of research you've done a lot of um stuff around the issues of racism um not just in cricket but um on a on a broader scale as well but the um, so there is a um, yeah more than an element of expertise when we come to talking about this uh, in on this podcast. Um, should we start with the racism part of this because obviously Got there's it. three three strands to the uh, ICEC report. We'll get to the other two um, later. Actually, before I get on to racism, do you think it's healthy um, that the I Cindy Butts and the rest of the uh, ICEC um, guy is responsible for talking to people and? Um, writing up this report have included um, not not just racism. I was actually expecting this just to be about racism, but they've included sexism, they've included um, elitism in there as well. Do you think that's a good thing? Yes. Yeah. And I, th- I think the vast majority of people, <clears throat> excuse me, expects it to be about racism. Um, and I'm really thrilled that it's not just about racism. Uh, again, I can't speak as, as sort of easily i suppose to the kind of gender element or the elitism side, kind of class-based uh, side of the report but i think ultimately what this boils down to and and what i think we often overlook is just how those different kind of characteristics they work in tandem often so the report yeah. will talk about how they're intersectional so how <clears throat> excuse me how racism can be or how racist kind of uh, exclusion based on race can be exacerbated by being working class but also being a woman for instance yeah. and then similarly you know can you know can create additional exclusions and, and and i suppose perpetuate that so i think it is really really important but then similarly i think it's it's really important because it, it shows that across this kind of inequity across the system so we know that racism exists we've debated that the evidence is there and I think actually this is a good opportunity to kind of shine a light and say, well, hang on a minute. It's not just about solving the racism issue because there's a series of other things that are kind of going wrong here. And therefore it forces people's hands, doesn't it? To go, oh, oh, actually, yeah, we, we thought we got racism covered. But actually, no, we've got other things to consider now. And that, and, and I think that is really positive. Well, it's positive moving forward. Clearly not positive as a finding. You say um, people have accepted that racism exists in cricket. Um, I'm still getting messages today from people <laughs> saying this is absolute nonsense. Yeah, they just we should just ignore this. Um, somebody was saying um, you can tell this was written by a black person. That kind of thing. Um, you know, it's geared up to actually find this result. I mean, it's just purely on a very base level. It's not in the ECB's interest to embarrass themselves by saying the whole game is in, a, in a, unequal, is it? No, it's not. And I, and I think, you know, the, the commission was was pretty open 
in in saying that they kind of they thought that the ECB was very brave in putting itself out there or putting themselves out there for this level of critique. Um, and again, I go back to the comment earlier around offering the 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 county's guidance. I think the ECB are in a similar boat in that respect because again, you don't know what you don't know at the yeah. end of the day, do you? And there'll be specific expertise within within the ECB. They've got a, you know EDI managers and engagement managers and all of this. But their job is not on a daily basis to kind of root out entrenched historical racism or or homophobia or or, or sexism. So actually, this is a it's an opportunity for them to learn through the commission, through the four thousand odd people who have who have actually given evidence to go right. Okay, we know what to do now, hmm. and you know that that's the like I said, that's the lightning rod, isn't it? Having worked in cricket a little bit, the I think there's a misconception from outside of the game, people looking in that there are huge numbers of staff working at every single county and uh, you know, even the ECB, a lot of talk about how many people work there, but you know, often things like EDI and, and things are just tagged onto somebody's existing role, aren't yeah. they? And you suddenly, I'll read a couple of things on it and then all of a sudden you, you know, the, the, you're the EDI manager and it's, it, it's a little bit more complicated than that, isn't it? You need a little bit more. And one of the recommendations was that, uh, you know, the game actually had an EDI director or whatever, wasn't it? Somebody to actually oversee the process. Yeah, and uh, like I said, what's come through really strongly in the report is that it's not just it's clear it's clearly not an elastoplast moment, is it? You know, you're not going to be able to just bandage over over this. There will always be, I think, the the um, not the tendency, but there's a risk of things being done quickly and in mm. and very, in a very responsive way. And that, and that is the, probably the kind of work that the ECB and others have done because they've got someone who's in post who's not really overseeing it. It's just, right, oh, shit, you know, this has happened, mm -hmm. pardon me. You you need to go away and do something about that now. Might even be on a six-month contract or something it, just to come it, in and sort something out. Abs yeah. Absolutely. It's just that quick win. Let, let's get it done let's, so that we've got some optics to say we're doing it, we're on the case. Whereas the, you know, whereas the ICEC investigation is clearly, it's not about short-term wins. It's about how do we fix mm -hmm. this game and of course, you know, that'll be transferable into other sports. How do we fix sport in general? How do we fix society, I suppose? Um, and so that will require much more systemic change, clearly, within cricket, but it will require, you know, significant oversight. You can't hand this report over to the counties and say, fix yourselves. I mean, what, you know, what, what yeah. are they supposed to do with that? Yeah. And, and the ten, I mean, this is a saying in the intro, though, that for me anyway, you know, despite the fact that Azim first came out and spoke about three years ago uh, and despite there's been apologies from Yorkshire despite there's been you know references made by the ECB to supporting Azim and 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 you know wider Th this to me Thomas is the first time that cricket has actually properly taken responsibility for this I reckon in the past it's been oh let's wear a few t-shirts let's see if we can get if we can ride out the next two weeks we're going to be okay everything will go back to normal this is the first time I think where probably a sport in the country but cricket certainly has actually taken properly responsibility and look like they are going to deal with it I think understandably they've waited haven't they They've wanted to know what was in it in order to respond properly and from a from a kind of optics perspective that that the report was delayed for so long has really not helped in that respect because mm -hmm. it, it seems like they've just been impotent for quite a long time and, and just kind of sat there and done nothing and hoped that it would just go away and I don't necessarily get the impression that that is what is going on. I think it was a case of we need to, we can't do anything. We can't implement anything until we get the ICEC report. Yeah, we need to be seen to be doing, but ultimately we don't want to put in place something and then a yeah. new report come out and that's not goes against it, but perhaps we're not going far enough or we're going in a slightly different direction. So I think they've just, I think that waiting and that impasse, it's not looked brilliant. But I do think that there's a, I do think there's a, a rationale behind it. Yeah, and they've they've given. I quite like the built-in three months that they've said. You know, just go away and they've effectively said, go away, read this, think about it for three months, and then come back with something. Um, yes. Rather than because the the tendency would be for journalists, for um, anybody really, to kind of just grab hold of somebody from the ECB and say, what are you doing about this? Tell me now. Tell me now. What's going to happen? But they've actually got a chance to actually sit back and think it through, haven't they? Yeah. And, and there's always that danger. And again, this is the Barnsley kind of pessimist in me, by the way, uh, which is 
with the was it the eleven point plan? Was it eleven? Whatever it was, twelve the, point plan. Which 12, seems the twelve to have, point plan. It, which it was, was like, that, that was being updated, Thomas, about every week at one stage when the heat <laughs> was on, and then we've not seen it since. No, and but all that happened was that they just kind of pulled a, a you know a bunch of people into a room and said, "We need to come up with a plan," without actually saying, "Let's take time mm. and let's be considered." And let's be reflective about it. And let's get lots of different stakeholders from lots of different places into the room and say, right, how do we collectively move forward with this? Yeah. And I hope that that's what happens this time, because the 12 point plan was nonsense in the way that it came about. I'm not saying the plan itself was nonsense, but the manner in which it was mm. created was 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 farcical. It's firefighting, isn't it? Rather than actually properly strategically thinking things through. And I, I said at the time, I thought with the you know the twelve point plan, and certainly with this, um, this is a chance to actually get out there into the shires, um, go and sit in um, town halls, invite in people to come and talk to you. There's no stupid suggestions on the tech. You know, you say whatever you want to say, get things off your chest, tell us what we need to do to help you. What have been your experiences? What what can we do better? Yeah. Why do you, why do you not? I mean, obviously, we're in both in Yorkshire. Why, as a British Asian sitting in Bradford, do you not go and watch cricket at Headingley when you watch Pakistan on the television every single time they're on? What What is the disconnect? Tell, explain it to us so that we can understand what um, what's going on here, so we can actually make make it better. I think all of that is time. I think it's just that that kind of being time poor in that respect. The I think there's that sense of we've asked the questions now we've kind of we've done the insight gathering now we need to act and often action is based on i was going to say poor intel but insufficient intelligence i suppose there's there's insufficient background work done yeah. in order to inform that we we can't be guilty of that on this occasion you know there's 4000 odd responses the you know the, the insight gathering has been done and now it's a case, well, how do we use that insight? Yeah, there'll be regional specificities, but I can't see the counties going back out to their communities now and saying, what do you think of the ICEC report? Because mm. that could take six months. Mm. And then you're in that period of paralysis again. There will now be that period where, yeah, there's three months, but then they'll want action. And so I don't think they'll be able to justify more insight and, and intelligence gathering. As a researcher... <laughs> Um, 60 million people, or whatever, live in the uh, in the UK, whatever it is these days. Um, 4,000 people on the basis of that does not sound that many people, but that's actually quite robust st um, statistically, isn't it? I think from a from the kind of work that they did. I mean, I don't know if you filled out any of the any of the paperwork, presumably presented some kind of evidence. It was fa it was fairly rigorous in the way that they did it, and they've interviewed people, they've sent out a survey, they've invited people to submit their own evidence. As far as it goes, I think it is fairly it is fairly robust. The key always is, you know, who are the respondents? So is it, you know, is it we would refer to re, is it represent is it rep, representative? So have you got a fair reflection of the number of white people in the community to Asian people to black people and, and you know women and girls and, and so on? So if you kind of skewed to one towards one community, you're not gonna get kind of um you know, yeah. valid data, so to speak. But I, I think as far as I can tell, I don't think they'd have stopped until they'd got that because they wouldn't, it wouldn't have stood up to scrutiny. And that, that may well partly explain the delays kind of, we need to go out, we need to get more. We haven't, you know, we need to target certain groups perhaps. I've been called woke in about 20 different ways <laughs> today. Um, and I've been told that this is just ridiculous and there isn't racism. I'm still getting told all of that kind of stuff. Um, for anybody that was to say that to you, what would be your response? Well, thankfully, I'm not big enough on Twitter to be called uh, anything by anyone. I'll put um, your, well, let's put your screen name up so you can get your loads of <laughs> so you, can, you can get loads of abuse. Oh, thanks things. for that. That's really good. <laughs> um, I, I, I kind of wear that with a badge of honour, actually, you know, that, that people are, you know, that they feel incensed by what you're saying enough to to, to go down that 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 route but i also think it's a reflection of that kind of defensiveness um within cricket and that that resistance and i've said that before there, there will be plenty of resistance to this report there'll be resistance to any suggestion that cricket is not perfect and brilliant and and whatnot and 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 that's fine people are, are kind of entitled to that i think you've got to get to the point where that you've got the this was the when the voices that say cricket needs to change become louder then actually they drown out the, the resistors, yeah. don't they? And I do think it's heading in that sort of direction. 
you're not you can't a colleague said to me the other day you can't educate someone out of their racism and i was like yeah actually do you know what you're right you know you can't you can't suddenly send someone on a course and say you're racist it's bad let me teach you about racism and then hope that they walk out not being a racist anymore because racists celebrate their racism they're quite happy to be racist and they surround themselves by other racists I'm so, a devout racist rather than a devout Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and that's, you know, we, we had an American president who was quite happy to be openly racist. That's, that's it, you know. So you're not going to change that. What you've got to do, I guess, is kind of promote a culture around them whereby actually when the racist is racist, people feel strong enough to call them out rather than just let it pass by, um, you know, unnoticed. And and that's and that's where cricket needs to go. It needs to empower people to to kind of drown out the misogyny and the racism and call people out for it. I, I don't know if you've done any newspaper reading today, um, but Jonathan Liu's piece in the Guardian was absolutely exceptional. Um, so much so that I actually picked up the phone and texted him and told him that because I just thought yeah, that, that often do the fanboy tweets to a fellow journalist, but the, uh, <laughs> I thought it was absolutely brilliant. Um, on the flip side of that, Michael Atherton's piece in the Times. Um, I found hard to read, actually, um, because he was almost not making excuses, but he actually, there was a piece in it, I can't, and this is paraphrasing, it's not direct quoting, um, but he said something along the lines of, um, despite all of that, there are plenty of people within cricket who have a wonderful time and make lifelong friendships, and, you know, it's a glorious thing. If you're looking at a report that's just told you that 87% of um, Pakistani and Bangladeshi um, participants have had racism, nearly as many Indian um, heritage um, participants have had racism, black people, 72, 75% had had experiences of racism. Effectively, the people that Michael Atherton's talking about are the people in the very small chunks of those groups who haven't, and white people, aren't they? Isn't he? Yes, and those people who are being the racists are having a wonderful time being racist, mm. <laughs> I, I suppose. I think, again, that, that w what this boils down to is that, that culture of cricket whereby people are enjoying doing what they're used to doing without mm. any regard for how what they do may well be perceived as exclusionary or racist. And, you know, I don't, you know when we talk about kind of experience racism, you know, the 70 odd percent or whatever it is, I would be very surprised if they're referring specifically, though, actually, no, I probably wouldn't be surprised, to overt name-calling, overt racism, or whether they're talking about those kind of racial microaggressions like being served a ham sandwich at lunch. Hmm. You know, for me, that's racist. You know, if you know, you know, or it's kind of demanding, you know, or it's, you know, it's, it's the drinking, all of these things are, you know, they're racist or they're exclusionary based yeah. on, certain, on on racial lines. That lack of um, that lack of understanding that maybe even despite having pointed it out, it still happens. Yeah, or, or indeed vindictively doing it. Mm. You know, I've I've been to clubs who have been, you know, they've been asked in advance, don't do it, and they've basically said piss off. And yeah. I've been to clubs who have gone, actually, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, absolutely, of course we won't. And they've put out kind of, you know, so here are the here are the teas. It's a minor thing, but it's not a it's a minor thing, but it's not minor in the grand scheme mm. of things. Most cricket teas are buffets, aren't they, effectively? Mm. You know, very rarely do you get to sit down and, you know, with a knife and fork and someone serve you a plate with food on. And so actually openly saying, right, OK, so move away from the sausage roll and the ham sandwiches. We've prepared you something over here. Mm. You know, and that's not outing people. It's like being in a corporate environment and then saying, well, they're, they're the vegan sandwiches. You know, it's, yeah. it's the equivalent. Of, you would never dream of putting catering out for staff members, say in a university, and not providing vegetarian, vegan Gluten free and all of these things. So why would you openly serve things that you know are culturally sensitive to to certain racialized minorities, for instance? I, I wasn't listening to um, BBC Radio Five this morning, but apparently Nicky Campbell on his morning show um, covered this subject and had a lot of uh, and this was um, from social media a lot of very um, posh sounding middle class whatever. Um, white people phoning up to say, well, I, we've never seen anything like this and our club is absolutely marvellous. Um, it's probably them that need, not saying that each of those people needs to listen, but it's those people who who are so set in their ways and so indignant who probably need to actually sit down and speak to a person of colour and say, how is this club for you? Yes. I think, you know, often th those kind of, 
lived experiences and that sharing are the things we just don't do, do we? So, you know, those those people that you referred to, you know, if we were going to if we were going to stereotype, and let's assume that they, that they live in a leafy suburb surrounded by other middle class white people, and actually the only time they encounter a black or brown person is probably at the doctors. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, like it's Jerry and Margot Ledbetter out the good life, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah. And you know, they're not they're not going to recognise those challenges unless they encounter them. Because unless they've lived it and they've seen it and they've actually, you know, been called out about it, it's just something they hear about in the news or in the newspaper or watching TV. It's not something that they actually experience. But you don't routinely pull those people into, like you say, into the village hall or or whatever it is and say, you know, he, he, hear their story. It'll, it'll, it'll make your skin, your skin crawl. And why would you? Why would you subject those minorities to that experience? Because it's just yeah. cruel, isn't it? Yeah, I um, th there was uh, when I was in Zimbabwe once. Um, I was taken down to a local bar through this little village, right out in the sticks in this little village, and I was the only white guy for probably about two hundred mile radius. And uh, walking down to this bar, these little kids started surrounding me, um, and I was thinking, "What is going on here?" So I asked the person I was with, and they said, "Oh, they're, they're talking about you." And I said, "What they're talking about?" And they said, oh, "You're white, and they've never seen a white person before." Yeah, yeah. And um, I, and then we walked a little bit further on. They started laughing, and I said, "What are they saying now?" And he said, uh, "They want to touch you to see what you feel like." So I put my arm out to them, um, <laughs> like so, and they started stroking my arm, and then they started laughing again, saying, they, "He feels just like us." That's what they were saying. They were chattering yeah. about the fact that my skin, the what my white skin, felt exactly like their black skin. Yeah. And that I kind of thought about that a lot. That was um, 2012. Um, that is basically, in a nutshell, the lack of understanding. And actually, if we could all just metaphorically touch each other's arms, and actually get a little bit of a grip as to what makes people tick, because we're all the same, really, in terms of our basic desires. It's just a few. Um, religious or whatever um, things around the edges that make us different, which is interesting, isn't it? And if you actually understand that, that makes the world a better place, isn't it? Or am I yeah, just absolutely. an aging hippie? Yeah, no, I don't think I don't <laughs> think so. I think that's just again, that's that openness, isn't it? Of when you pull, you know, you you pull a group of I don't know under nine kids together for a for a cricket game, and you actually encourage them to talk to one another and learn from one another, yeah. you know. I don't know whether they get that whether kids get this kind of education within schools, for example. I, I'm, I'm sure they do. They learn about you know cultural differences and whatnot. I'm sure it's probably part of RE, which of course all kids despise for, for just because it's RE. Um, but you know my my eldest, who's in what year five of primary school, everything I say to him now is, "Oh, but daddy, that's a stereotype." My like, Christ, you know. So they're learning stereotypes at school. Yeah. Now every you know every time you say something or you see something, you say, "Is that a stereotype?" You know, is that you know, you know, is it blackbird? Oh, but are they all? Is that a stereotype? It's a blackbird, sweetheart. I don't know how to, I don't know how to break down what a blackbird is. But yeah. for him, he he kind of sees the defin definition of a stereotype. And he said, "You're stereotyping that a blackbird is chirpy or is greedy or whatever it is." And he and he can even so he takes the stereotypes into non-human contexts as well. But mm. that's ultimately it, isn't it? We don't again. I'll come back to we don't know what we don't know. Yeah. So it boils down to where do you get that knowledge from? And if you don't have that knowledge, then actually, you know, you can't really be called out as vindictive for saying something that you shouldn't say, unless someone then says, "Ooh, you know, you, that that is actually quite offensive." But you've got to have you've got to have it in you to do that. We, and we've got to allow people, haven't we, to make mistakes sometimes. Yeah, if you're <clears> talking <throat> about matters of race, if you're talking about things that are, are surrounding different cultures and stuff, and um, somebody is a little bit ignorant, a little bit clumsy, a little bit, a little bit stupid, and they say something which is out, out, out of well, probably racist. You've got to allow them to actually be able to take a step back, modify their behaviour, and come back and say it the right way next time, haven't you? Rather than just cancel people left, right, and centre. Yeah, you have, and, and they're really difficult conversations. And 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 I'll refer to my own, like so, so. Someone called me out not long since. I did a. I did a lecture for a colleague around EDI, uh, and we were talking about use of the P word, use of the you know the the N word, and things like that. Uh, and I used a very common 
word starting with G to describe the traveller community. And I used an example of how my father, who was a mechanic, always said he would never buy a car from a member of that community because of various yeah. stereotypes. And she was of Irish heritage. And at the end, she said, can I just pull you to one side and said, I actually really don't like you using that word. Said it to me and my, you know, my community and my ancestors, that is the equivalent of calling me a P word or an N word. Yeah. Thank you for letting me know, because actually I didn't politicize it in the same way or in my mind. It wasn't the same. And I don't know why it wasn't the same, but that's my ignorance. But I need someone to call me out so that I now understand and I can treat that more sensitively than I than I ever had done before. And, and that's, that's really important. That, I think that's key as well, because, yeah, I mean, I've, I've kind of since Azim came on the podcast, was well, it's Michael Carberry actually came on the podcast in about April 2020 uh, when George Floyd was murdered. I've thought about race a lot and I've dealt with race a lot. I had conversations with a lot of people about race. So you're always kind of learning as you go through life. And on this issue particularly, I've learned an awful lot over the last three years. Um, still not perfect. Still, um, you know, don't understand everything, don't know everything, far from it. And I think anybody that thinks they are, are it's, it's dangerous, isn't it? Because we, we, you kind of need to adapt your behavior and actually learn from other people as you go through. Yeah, absolutely. You, you've just got to be you've got to be open to accepting other people's points of view, haven't you? And and being flexible in your in your own approach and being flexible in your own approaches. And that and again, that comes back to as you said around the kind of structures of the game and how they just they've been so set in stone and so unmoving that they have not necessarily through any sense of um, vindictiveness again, but probably just out of I suppose historical ignorance that actually these practices are exclusionary. Mm. I don't think anybody, like I say, I'd, I'd be very surprised if there was anybody within the game who openly sits down and says, "I don't want you know, c county coaches. I don't want black kids in my side." I'd be very surprised. And but they won't think too much about how if they look around their dressing room and find no black kids in it. I'd be very surprised if coaches are going, hmm, where are all the black, you know, where are the black kids in my dressing yeah. room? There must be some black talent out there or Asian talent or whatever it is. So they won't really think anything of it, but equally they won't go out of their, they won't go out of their way to exclude, but equally they won't go out of their way to include either. You mentioned earlier that sexism isn't your speciality. Um, elitism probably isn't either. And um, I mean, as you said, they're in, entwined to a, to a large degree as well, but I was interested, um, I, I was A, happy, um, going back to a previous point, I was happy that those were included alongside racism for what you said earlier, but also because I think if it had just been a report on racism, the same old people would have come out and said, oh, they keep going on about race. Um, but because it's actually allied to two other things, which I think we can broadly agree on, um, there's not too much controversy in that um, uh, so many professional cricketers come from private schools, which is actually a very small percentage of the educational system, but creates a huge percentage of um, English professional cricketers. Uh, and we can all, I mean, I, I've seen so many instances of sexism at cricket grounds down the years that it's, you, know, you could almost write a book on it. Um, so I don't think they're too controversial, really. It's obviously how the IC, ICEC has um, interpreted that and how they've made recommendations in each of those cases. But, I actually think because racism has gone alongside those two other things, it's actually made it easier for racism to go through this process um, and be accepted alongside two things which are broadly accepted anyway. I think in the, in the UK, ra race and racism is just, I just think it's more contested yeah. than, you know, say gender. I think most people, again, would agree that men and women should be treated equally. They should receive equal pay for doing the same job and all of this. And and gender is the thing that most most organisations, for example, can get on board with gender and say, right, we've got a board of 10 people, so let's have a gender balance. They get that. That's an, that's an easy thing for them to understand. But they then struggle when you start to align that with other identity markers. So, you know, we need an equal, you know, equal number of men and women, but then we also need a proportion of them to be from an ethnic minority background. It's at that point when you start to chuck in another variable that people go, hang on a minute, why? They don't seem to get or they seem to challenge 
race, ethnicity and issues around race equality more than they would about gender. I think the class issue, I, I think that that will, I don't think that that will be allowed to go by unchal unchallenged. I think there will be a lot of people out there, the hoity toities, who will say, hang on a minute. Rrr, rrr, and I think that they will, they'll find umbrage in any you suggestion can, that their sport I, is elitist. I can almost see somebody in a stuffed shirt somewhere in a committee room going, well, I don't mind having a few more um, brown fellows here. And I don't I mind, maybe, maybe we can pay the women a bit more, but well, we need to have the Eaton Harrow game at Lords. It's, it's like you can, I can actually hear somebody saying that because I've seen those conversations happening at cricket grounds. Because um, that was one of the recommendations, wasn't it? Eaton Harrow at Lords, yeah. no, yeah. no more. Yeah. yeah, Eaton Harrow, Oxford, and Cambridge. And let's be honest, uh, replaced the... replaced by a state school competition yeah. with a finals day at Lords. Yeah, which is interesting. So I mean, how many? And that's another matter in it, in itself, isn't it? I mean, you know, where do these state school, you know, cricket teams come from? Because I don't know any in Barnsley. There's not many here. I can assure you. And as someone who came through that system, we didn't play very much cricket either. And when we did, it was it was pretty awful. Um, and I don't think, from what I can gather, a great deal has changed in that respect. There's no investment in school facilities in state schools. I it's one of those. Is. Yeah, you know, teachers in themselves, and I'm not knocking teachers, they get netball and they get football. You know, they're the kind of playground sports, they're the basketball, they're the common denominator. They get that. It's easy peasy to get a team of 11 or whatever it is, boys and girls, to play those sports. And you can put a net up in a sports hall and give people yeah. badminton rackets and just leave them alone, can't you? Yeah, easy peasy. And and like I say, with all the will in the world, in a, in my kids' primary school, could they pull out eleven kids to play a cricket match? You know, they're only in primary school, but no, no, they couldn't. Actually, at this mm. moment in time, there are not eleven people in that primary school who could play a game of cricket, mm. and so it, they they don't push cricket. It's not a good use of resources. Yeah. I had somebody said to me today, um, we've got um, too obsessed with the minutiae, basically, to paraphrase, and uh, using the term batter instead of batsman, that doesn't achieve anything. Um, there's far bigger things to do. Um, or we don't want to just get obsessed with England um, playing test cricket at Lords if they're women um, and, and that kind of stuff. People get preoccupied with one, there's like a 320 page report, whatever it was, yeah, yeah. with an executive summary, which wasn't that much smaller. Um, and they get obsessed with one thing. Um, and and report, it's like equal pay for women has basically obsessed the BBC today. Yeah. Um, and in regards to what you think of that, whether it's right or wrong, I, I personally think um, if it's not equal, it should be a lot closer. Um, then the. Yeah, you're forgetting everything else that's in that report. It's 45 recommendations, 43 recommendations. You think oh, about yeah, just one yeah. and centering a whole program on just that one. Yeah, but I mean, similarly, you look at the the hundred for 2023, and I know that's divisive, but in itself, you know, that's where the I suppose the big books are. I suppose in this country, the highest paid women are paid 1,250 quid more than the lowest paid male. Mm. That that I mean. Right. And, and generally, the, the suggestion there is, well, you should just be grateful that we're paying you anything, mm. you know, because you're not, you know, you're not good enough to be a competition in your own right just yet. And maybe it will get there, maybe it won't. But then you look at the Women's Premier League in India and we've got players walking away with, what, 350 yeah. grand? And if, you, if, you don't, if you don't actually show something to be a Premier competition or a Premier form of the sport, it's never going to be that, is it? So no. you, you've got to treat it as such. Um, and and I saw a really interesting tweet, uh, tweet earlier that was, um, why why are lots of men obsessing with Sophie Eccleston, the slow left armour for the England women's yep. test team, who's just taken 10 wickets and bowled beautifully at Trent Bridge? Why are, why are we obsessing with her getting into the men's team? For her, the pinnacle is to play for the women's team. Forget the men's team. She wants to play for the women. And, yeah, and we kind yeah. of we are guilty of that, aren't we? Because we kind of we see the men's team as being a step up from the women's yeah. team. Yeah. yeah, I mean, at the end, at the end of the day, they're different, aren't they? And this has always been one of the the problems levelled at anyone who talked about women's sports. Saying, oh, it's not as good as the men's. It's not a fair comparison. It's not the men's. Mm. You know, and we need to start thinking about you know women's sport as women's sport. It's not a yeah. precursor to or a you know a. a I suppose a preface to the male game it's a completely different product it's a completely different thing and we should treat it as independent and we should celebrate it for what it is as opposed to what it isn't 
Yeah, I don't, I don't know, know if you watched it, but I, I loved the test match, the Ashes test the, at Trent Bridge. I, I watched, um, I was working on two of the days, but I watched three full days of it uh, and really enjoyed it. It was really good. As you say, just different, slightly different pace, but different skills on the show. And, you know, very, very competitive. It was, it was fantastic. But then me and my dad would debated this on Sunday when I popped through to see him and he got the test match on. Uh, and we, we had a discussion around, for example, I understand, you know, or he was saying, you know, I understand, you know, from a physicality perspective, at present, the women are not going to bowl 85, 90 miles an hour. I mean, you've got, you know, Shabin, you know, Ishmael, who's touching 80 miles an hour, but she's way beyond yeah. the vast majority. You know, you might touch 74, 75, but not necessarily consistently. So we're debating that. And then he would say, but however... I still don't understand why the batters, therefore, are finding it challenging to face a 67, 68 year old, uh, 67 mile an hour ball. Because why are they, they could practice on a bowling machine like anybody else at 90 miles an hour and train their reflexes. But that's a different game. Yeah. If you're facing a 90 mile an hour ball and then you get a 68 mile an hour ball, you've not practiced for the game situation. I did that once, actually. Exactly what you just said. I, I went into the nets at Henningley. I kept ranking up the racking up the bowling machine. We're just in front of a, a staff. This is media uh, match. Got somebody to rack up the bowling machine by five miles an hour. Five miles an hour makes a lot of difference. Yes. That, yeah, that yeah. increase. So you basically miss about three. Then you kind of gradually train yourself to get used to that increased pace. And then you rack it up a little bit again. So I was getting used to facing this bowling machine about eighty miles an hour. I think in the end, which was quick. Um, and I'd made sure it was full pitched outside off stump, so I'm going to kill myself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then I got to playing in the um, staff against media game, and the person bowled me a ball which bounced about twice, trickled towards my stump. So I played about ten shots before it got to me. You know, yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a completely different pace. It's a different skill. Yeah, it's, it's like the t there was the tweet the other day. Was it um, was it Jordan Clark had tried to bowl a bumper in that? It, it's all, yeah. it was all over Twitter, and whoever it was, was it is it was it Josh Bohannon or something? Yeah. And he'd, he'd had like about three swipes in it before it yeah. had got there. But that that's you know that's what it feels like sometime in that you you're honing your skills for 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 a different game but you know so it's not about you can't necessarily use the pace of the ball and and drive consistently for example or drive on the up or whatever it is you've got to learn to scoop and and sorts of other things because that's a different product isn't it if you watch it expecting it to be like the men's game mm. then maybe you might be disappointed i don't know if you would be or not that's probably not a fair characterization but you would be deceived. That's not because that's not what you've tuned in to watch. It's different no. and we no. should treat it as different. And as I say, we should celebrate it for its difference. I am um, in the past. We've had these little spikes in suddenly everybody's angry about racism being in cricket or angry about sexism being in cricket. We had it, excuse me, had it around Azim's appearance at the DCMS. We had it when George wrote a piece about um, the P word not being um, banter. Yeah, um, we've had these little spikes where all of a sudden it's um, what what social media is filled with. We're going to be discussing this, the rights and wrongs of, um, and then I've, it kind of just dies down. And then you tweet about something about three weeks later, and people say, "Oh, gosh, you're not still going on about that, are you?" We can't have that in this, can we? we after after Cindy Butts and Co. and the ICEC have gone to all of this and put this down in black and white and actually told the game. You are effectively institutionally racist, institutionally sexist, and institutionally elitist. We can't allow that little downward trend to kind of just allow this to just disappear again. No, but it, but equally, and I get what you're saying. Equally, I think if if ECB and the clubs and and whatnot are trying to maintain that kind of public interest in itself and it and in its response to this. There is that danger that they act too quickly to make sure that it that they don't that they couldn't be accused of not doing anything. Whereas actually sometimes it's it's it is about the the, the kind of slow road and taking your time. But perhaps you just need to keep kind of dropping updates. You know, we're working on this as opposed to we've done this. It's like well, well it's, we're not we're I'm not doing. We're on to thinking about how we're going to do it. So, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> um, the uh, it, it was going back to that twelve point plan. Um, when there was all the hoo ha uh, right at the start, there was about an update every three days. Then it was an yeah. update every week, an update every two weeks. I don't think we're, I don't know where the last update on that twelve point plan was. It's just kind of out of out of mind. We'll just get on with everything else now because people have forgotten about it. That that's the the worry for me is that this um, 
you know, you're never going to get a situation where there is no racism in cricket or society. You're never going to get that. There's always going to be somebody doing something somewhere. But it's how uh, it's how cricket then deals with that situation, isn't it? At the moment, you've not maybe got the mechanisms to deal with that situation very well. We need to get those mechanisms in place. We need to make sure there's access for people. We need to make sure that people are treated fairly and friendly when they get to grounds or when they get to play uh, in, in their local teams. There's all of these things that they need to start to build these building blocks to achieve. Um, I've given you some clues there, Thomas, and you knew all those already. But my uh, one of the final questions was going to be, if I was to put you in charge at the ECB now, they appoint you as the new EDI director. Your name's on the door. What is the first, you know, after you've had a little bit of time to think, what's the first thing you would do? That's a really awful question to finish on because I thought we were, we, we were getting into that. You've lulled me in and you pulled me in. I was feeling comfortable. Um, again, and it, this is actually in conflict to what I what I said at the beginning, which was around time and people not collecting, collecting more insight. And actually the time now was for action and people were bored of collecting insight. If I went into any organization, I want to know about that organization. So I would, you know, I would want to know from every single person within that organization, what do they want? You know, what are their priorities? And and similarly, I want to know how they would how they would do it, because yeah. otherwise it becomes a minority voice that's making decisions on behalf of communities that they don't belong to. You know, for, mm -hmm. for me, these things, they have to be co-created with the communities in which they serve. And so you know, the, the whole, you know, there might be a, say, a Black Caribbean action plan. I absolutely fundamentally agreed that we need that. And I advocated for that previously in written work. Um, no one listened. No, it's not that no one listened. No one took any, paid any attention to it at that time because it wasn't an issue. Yeah. <laughs> Racism yeah. wasn't an issue then. But it's exactly what we said. You know, you focus on South Asian engagement and that's all well and good. And yes, that was needed. But you've neglected other minority ethnic communities you've got a women and girls strategy you've got a disability strategy and all of this like okay but what about the other groups that we're that we're that we're not engaging with so again at that point everything comes through co-creation it comes through consultation because again i keep saying i don't know what i don't know i wouldn't profess to know everything and in those situations where i don't know i'll go and try and find out the answer and yeah. invariably that that's through learning through other people because i acknowledge my limitations and the ecb and others have to do that so well actually we don't know the answer so we're going to go find it from somewhere else yeah. but don't exploit those communities don't ask them what they think and what they need and then ignore them mm. because i think you know a lot of communities are suspicious of cricket authorities mm. it's the same people that you go to the same voices they say the same thing and then a decade later they said i told you this a decade ago yeah and and that does not build trust I've had that today, Thomas. I've had um, responses today to various tweets I've done where they said, heard it, heard it all before. Yeah. Um, you might be calling this the ICEC report, looking yourself in the mirror, whatever it's called, or you know, the game looking yourself in the mirror. But this was done 10 years ago and nothing's ever happened. We've been talking about this for decades. Nothing's ever changed. There is that resentment. There is that resistance. There is that mistrust, isn't there? Yeah, there really is. And, and you asked, again, you know, earlier around... You know, I've got British Pakistani communities in Bradford who love cricket, but they don't go to Headingley, but they watch Pakistan every week. Why don't they go to Headingley? You've just answered your own question in that yeah. respect. They don't go to Headingley because Headingley is not a place for them no. in that respect, because Headingley was a place where they were racially abused and no one did anything, or their parents were racially abused and no one did anything, or, yeah. you know, all, all of those things, they take time to overcome, you know, th those perceptions. And there's a lot of trust building that needs to happen and that's why i keep saying it will take a long time because it's not just about chucking a policy at it and saying oh this is the right policy at the right time because it's a slow burner because it's significant change that's recommended here it's a relationship like a a loving relationship or a friendship um whatever isn't it if you, if you let somebody down and they start to not trust you then they're they're reluctant to throw themselves back in again and that see, no, it's no different between communities and between different groups of people is it no, you've got to nurture. You've got to nurture these communities. You know, cricket is it's our it's our sport. It's the one that we love. I, I don't love any any other sport as much as I love cricket. It's been my life for a long time, both as a player, spectator, research, whatever it is. I love this sport. Um, 
And it makes me really sad when you think that other other communities that love this sport don't love to be part of it. Mm. They play it and they watch it because they love it, but they don't feel welcome in it. Mm. And, you know, and, and the only reason that they continue to play despite not feeling welcome is because they love it so much. Yeah. And you think, Jesus Christ. I mean, you're in a, you're in a really, really, I mean, that that's a terrible situation, isn't it? Because yeah. they should want nothing more than to love doing what they love doing. And ultimately, ultimately we, we haven't provided that environment. I say we, you know, yeah. cricket has not provided that environment. You, you talked about co-creation and consultation, what have you, but that, that in turn creates a sort of co-ownership almost isn't it where everybody's in it together you know if you if you start to actually talk to groups and they can see that you're enacting it and they're involved in that then they they're part of that then aren't they and they're far more likely to carry on being a part of it yeah and i think it's how you then communicate that back i mean we have in i'm sure it's not you know it's not particularly revolutionary but within the university we we effectively do a kind of you said we did kind of scenario with the students oh you want more library resources all right well we, we've given you new library resources not in a sense of be grateful but just we're listening mm. um what what we've got historically is that you said we did nothing or you said we did it and we didn't tell you that we did it yeah. and it, it's that it's that it's that two-way reciprocal relationship isn't it in or, communication or sometimes even you you said and we lied about doing it and we haven't done anything yeah, yeah, or we couldn't do it. Or indeed, yeah, just yeah. say we can't do it. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember with, with that one of those pieces of work that we did early doors that kind of got conflated as this Fletcher report, uh, which I've defended that it's not, that that doesn't exist previously. But the 2015 one, where which we did with colleagues at, at the university with South Asian communities in Leeds and Bradford, I remember a focus group in one of the community centres where they said, we need about 20, 20 pitches to satisfy the demand for cricket in Bradford yeah and you were like you're not going to get that but that's what they said so what you need to turn around to do is say why you can't have that you know and, and just say, we'd love to provide you that but we can't what's the workaround as opposed yeah. to yeah we can't do it case closed that's not yeah. helpful to either to either party yeah. I mean that that that's a that's a, an ongoing dialogue kind of situation isn't it? We, we can't give you 20 but we can give you this instead you know, yeah, and then to, is that enough for you? Well, no, it's not. Well, let's have a look at how we can work around that and get something else for you as well. And yeah, yeah. and you know, and create, you know, within the Yorkshire context, everything was built not everything, but a lot was built around kind of Bradford Park Avenue, wasn't it? Mm. Again, Bradford's a bloody big place. Yeah, not everyone can get to Park Avenue. So, how do you t how do you take away that barrier? Well, is there a community bus? Mm. Is there a free bus service or what? You know, I don't know what it, what it is. Um, but again, you kind of put something in place and don't just drop it and think done mm. it's right okay so we we've done that but that's still not going to satisfy or it's still not going to overcome some of the barriers for others so how do we deal with those ones and you sort of start with a grand plan and then you you know mm. you you dull down into the into the minutiae as you say i'm going to I don't want to get too yorkshire centric but i was saying to somebody the other day we had a chat about it saying you know, if we could just start using a few more outgrounds you know, get get a first class game at bradford yeah. actually bring cricket you know we, we can't get you to headingly but if we actually bring it to you will you come down and maybe get it, get a bit excited about it and then maybe then come to headingly yeah you know, if, if you come down to bradford which is only um half a mile away then enjoy that then you might come to headingly that that kind of stuff where um Get, taking the game because Yorkshire's massive, isn't it? You know, yeah, Sheffield yeah, down absolutely. south, they don't feel like they're anywhere near Leeds. There's no. all these conversations going all the time. But maybe if you take the game to two people, and um, that might make a difference. Perhaps. Yeah, perhaps. I mean, we we debate it, we you debate it long and hard, don't you? And you think, right, the reason why people don't go, it must be because they can't afford to go. So give them some free tickets and they'll come. And then lo and behold, they don't come. Mm. Like, oh, clearly money wasn't the barrier then. So what was it? Mm, don't know. Well, you know, until you know why people don't come or indeed what would make them come, then you're guessing. And this is where I keep coming back to say you need to co-create. You need to have that insight because otherwise yeah. you put mechanisms in place that are not necessarily the right ones. So you, you think you're taking away barriers, but actually you, you might take away some, but then you create different ones. Yeah. Final question, Thomas, because I'm going to let you get, get, get going and enjoy the rest of your day. Um, yeah, James, that's what it is. 
and that's where the rest of your family are gone, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the sort of final thing in terms of your view on the world, in terms of your view on cricket and racism and everything like that's been going on, you've kept a close look in the last three years and, and before that. Are you happier now than you were this time yesterday before you knew what was in this ICEC report? I think so. I think so. A couple of people have asked me that today and I kind of think we, we can't be worse off, can we? Because now we've got some sort of, there's a blueprint or there, there is a there is a pathway, I suppose. It's really now a case of what within those recommendations can actually be enacted. Some are easier to enact than others. Some obviously are more short term, some are more, um, you know, more institutional um, in, in, in their reach. So I think I am happier in that there is that pathway. I think I would love to be a fly on the wall for those three months. And that's not an yeah. open call to me saying, it, you know, employ me to go on that committee. That's it. I'd love to know what the reaction to it is. And people that actually know, I mean, at the end of the day, we know cricket to a certain extent, but we don't really know the intricacies of how do, how do we actually do this and what's the relationship with the counties and how far can we push them to enact certain things? Because ultimately that's a kind of uh, governance issue. Hmm. I'd love to know what how the report lands and whether they say, oh, actually, do you know what? That's a bloody good idea. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. How do we do that? And then there'll be others that they just go, absolutely, we cannot do that. I'm sure there will be. Mm -hmm. And that, yeah, and that's that's fine, I suppose, in the short term. But you have to have a pretty robust reason for not doing it because you've commissioned this thing. Yeah. They've then come back and said, this is what you should do. Say so what it takes a strong person to say, no, we disagree with that. Because mm. presumably there then has to be that there needs to be something which is a reaction, an open reaction to it to say point by point, yes, absolutely, not sure about this one, yes, absolutely, can't do this one, this is why, blah, 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 blah. Mm. And I don't know if we'll ever get that, but I'd love to see that. Mm. No, it's going to be interesting. Um, I mean, from my point of view, I think I am happier um, today um, than I was before I found out what was in the ICEC report, purely because what I said earlier that. I think for the first time ever, cricket has actually held its hands up and said, yeah, they, this issue is actually live and real. They, they've said it before in some ways. They've worn T-shirts. They've had slogans. They've ni had yeah, nice yeah. pictures of Joss Butler with Moen Alley pretending everything's marvellous um, further afield. But I think today they actually did sit up and think, blimey, we've got to do something now, which is actually, that's massive progress for this game because... Um, yeah, I don't think that's existed before um, today or before yesterday. When the, yeah, and and uh, that that has got to be a step forward. But we've got to kind of keep watching and keep uh, keep pushing to make sure that things happen. I think there's been a genuine fear across the game about what was going to be in it mm. as well. I don't know whether those fears have been realised or whether they've sat back and gone, "Yep, that was totally expected," and there's yeah. no there's no. Uh, you know, there's no curveballs in it. Uh, I think the findings will will be hard to read, but they'll go, yeah, I, I can see that. I understand where that's been, and I'm not surprised by it. As I said, I think those recommendations are the key. But they go, actually, ooh, I suspect there are a few in there where they where they they will be surprised at how far they've gone with the recommendation and the level of detail and the specificity around how they would recommend that you do it. Yeah. I, I think they will come as a genuine surprise in some places. And, you know, like I say, it could be interesting to see whether they embrace them or or, re, or reject them. Yeah. I, I imagine what, I mean, it's often the case, isn't it? But what um, some counties, what maybe even the ECB say publicly and what they actually think behind the scenes might be two totally different things. As you say, there'll be some things in there that I'll be thinking over my dead body kind of stuff. And then other things that are probably more easy wins, aren't they? But uh, we will see how that progresses over the next, well, I'm sure, years, months, decades, whatever it's going to be. <laughs> And we'll carry on talking about it and we'll carry on putting pressure on for uh, change and inclusivity and all the important things, I think, in the world. Um, and uh, just getting along together, isn't it? Um, Thomas, thank you very much indeed for coming back on the podcast. Uh, appearance number two, d done and dusted. Let's make it a hat trick. Let's talk in a few months when we've got, a, when we've got an outcome of the ECB yeah. response. Three, three months from today. Away. Put it in your calendar. <laughs> Three months today, we'll come back and see if ECB have come out with anything and uh, see where we are with all that one. But um, enjoy the rest of your day. Come and get your hair cut. And 
I will, uh, I'm sure, talk to you again very, very soon indeed. Um, stay tuned, everybody. More Cricket Pleasure podcasts uh, coming up very soon indeed. Thanks for watching today. Thanks for listening later and see you again soon. Cheers all.